modern technology seems to do away with the need for skill. Cameras will focus themselves and adjust to the appropriate lighting. Specialized programs will write the correct rhythm for music. Can the same be said about sport? Especially if the sport relies on technology, as in Formula One racing. In this episode of Simple Infographic, we'll figure out which is more important, the racer's driving skill or the technical characteristics of the car. Let's begin by looking back on which route Formula One cars have taken, from the race's beginnings to present day. The idea to establish a competition like this first appeared in the 20th century during the 1930s. At that time, there were already popular track races, but they no longer left a strong impression. People wanted something new. However, World War II brought about changes that pushed this idea to the sidelines. The first Formula One world champion was inducted in 1950. The predominant car of the time was the Alfa Romeo 158 with an 8-cylinder engine and a 1.5-liter tank. The engine's horsepower was 400, an unreal level for the time. This automobile was developed back in 1938, and the first two champions earned the titles in an Alfa Romeo. It's worth noting that a familiar face in Formula One worked on the team of the first winner. His name says enough about him, Enzo Ferrari. By 1952, Ferrari's own car left everyone else in the dust. However, over the course of a few years, starting in 1954, Argentine racer Juan Manuel Fangio firmly defeated him. He won five championship titles, four of them in a row. Only Michael Schumacher and Lewis Hamilton would manage to surpass his numbers of victory. Fangio won championships regardless of engine, whether Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Ferrari, or Mercedes. But the biggest battle of the 50s was between the Mercedes and Ferrari brands. 1952 became the last year of the Alfa Romeo. Starting in 1954, the Ferrari 500 race car dominated. But in response to the Italian car, German engineers created the Mercedes-Benz W196. This model could have kept its lead if it weren't for one tragic event. In 1955, at the 24 hours of Le Mans race, the Mercedes race car flew off the track and into the nearby crowd. The wreck took the lives of 83 people, and another 120 people sustained injuries. Out of respect for the dead, Mercedes withdrew from Formula One and didn't return until 2010. However, this by no means left the lead to Ferrari. In the early 1960s, drivers and engineers from Great Britain invaded the race. In 1962, Colin Chapman of Britain created the revolutionary race car, the Lotus 25 Climax. This was the first race car to use a monocoque, a type of structural design which lacked a load-carrying frame, utilizing an external shell instead. Thanks to this design, which motor racing borrowed from aircraft construction, we can begin to see the race cars similar to ones that exist today. This solved the issue of air resistance and made the cars faster. If engine power played the main role at the start of Formula One's history, during the late 60s, engineers began to think about aerodynamics. Thus, in 1969, Colin Chapman created the Lotus 69 with use of spoilers. This aerodynamic feature on the body of the car created a gap between the car itself and the spoiler. Thanks to this, the car's grip on the surface of the road was improved, which ensured a higher speed. The 70s also began with technological innovation. Chapman created another revolutionary masterpiece, the Lotus 72 72D Ford. This race car's central feature was that it brought the radiators from the front of the car closer to the engine. This resulted in additional cool airflow. This shape brought one more distinguishing feature to Formula One race cars, side pontoons. Despite this considerable breakthrough from the engineering mind of Colin Chapman, his competitors were constantly on his tail. In 1974, the McLaren M23 Ford was released. Because of its high air intake, located behind the head of the driver, fans called this model the Iron. At the same time, several peculiar race cars were created, which were not noted for their technical achievement, but were still long remembered by followers of Formula One. Automotive constructor Derek Gardner revealed his six-wheeled sports car, the Tyrell P34 Ford in 1976. However, no one ever managed to win a world championship in this strange car. The 70s ended for Formula One with another innovation of Colin Chapman. In 1978, his Lotus 78 made its debut. The undercarriage of this race car consisted of a solid wing, thanks to which the car simply swam through asphalt. This significantly assisted the vehicle in making sharp turns at high speeds. Going into the 80s, technical racing continued, led by the McLaren team and Honda engines. At that time, the prefix turbo entered the lexicon of everyone on the planet. Turbo engines allowed cars to surpass 1,300 horsepower. However, McLaren's power fell behind the Williams team in 1992. The Renault FW14B entered the arena. Its 10-cylinder engine and electronic steering system allowed them to take the lead over McLaren's turbo engine. But in the early 2000s, the top spot was categorically returned to Ferrari, where it remained for the next decade. Besides its technical advantage, Ferrari had the best team of its time. Racer Michael Schumacher and automotive constructors Ross Braun and John Tote. The surname Schumacher came to be synonymous with speed in pop culture. 
but a tragic event at a ski resort seriously affected the racer's health and took him out of the sport forever. At that time, Team Red Bull joined the ranks of the leaders. This team's race cars maintained a high downforce that provided a smooth glide over the racetrack. However, after a few years, new tracks prevented them from relying on this downforce. The deciding factor shifted to engine power, which allowed Mercedes-Benz, after returning to the sport, to once again lead the championship. As the story of the evolution of race cars shows, often the constructors compete with each other more than the racers, and many drivers agree with that assessment. German racer Nico Rosberg, 2016 Formula One world champion, stated that the racers' driving skill only accounted for 20% of success. The other 80% rested on the shoulders of the rest of the team, mainly the constructors. In the entire history of Formula One, more than 800 drivers have participated in races. Now the majority of them have been forgotten. The career of a racer is short, no more than 30 races in a lifetime. 90% of participants never win a race, regardless of the model of race car they drive. And this is an argument for the side that driving skill does matter. Take legendary Argentine Juan Manuel Fangio, for example. He won 47% of his races that he participated in using different automobiles. This is an extraordinary statistic that can't be written off due to the model of the car. In 68% of races, he finished in the top 3. In 84%, he earned points, meaning he finished in the top 10. Many racers never even earn a single point in their whole career. However, Australian scholar Andrew Phillips argues that the statistics on victory and earned points don't reflect driving skill at all. Phillips believes that a driver's true skill is often hidden when they drive an unreliable or poorly controlled car, and that this skill can only be revealed by direct comparison to other drivers, separating them from the performance of their cars. Phillips identifies this skill using specific criteria. First is the expected results based on the particular car and team being used. And second is the actual result and its degree of superiority over the expected one. Phillips analyzed 64 racing seasons and found 38 times in which other drivers outperformed the winner based on his criteria. These racers were the best drivers, but simply were unlucky with their cars. According to Phillips' calculations, the best driver of all time was Jim Clark. His stellar career, along with his life, ended when Jim drove off the racetrack and into a tree. Another important factor is how often a driver switches from one team to another, since one racer changes race cars seven times throughout their career. However, according to research at the universities of Sheffield, Bristol, and Aarhus, around 75% of teams remain unchanged in the course of a year. Additionally, 86% of the differences in race results fall on the team, and driving skill only accounts for the remaining 14%. In other words, the driver's actual performance can be seen if the racers drive identical cars. But this typically doesn't happen. Competitions are held between different teams, each with their own technical indicators. And yet the statistics provided by Andrew Bell in the above studies predict race results with 94% accuracy. There were only two times when his predictions didn't come true. Once when the driver was killed, and in another case when the driver broke his leg. There are also some specific cases in which, despite a series of mistakes, the driver came in first thanks to the constructive elements of his car such as Lewis Hamilton, who over the course of a minute made a record number of mistakes. But his Mercedes still overtook Polish driver Robert Kubica. His ranking in the top 30 best racers didn't help the pole against the power of the German engine. That brings us to the next key element of auto sports, financing. If poor South American national football teams can achieve victory on talent alone, in auto sports, this is rare. Technical upgrades to race cars require massive investment and to make Formula One the most expensive sport on the planet. Mercedes and Ferrari exhausted over $400 million on their teams in 2019. After such incredible sums, it was decided to impose restrictions. No more than $145 million toward technical equipment in a year. However, since these sums do not include salaries and driver's fees, this doesn't prevent the top teams from hiring the best specialists in the world. Constant analysis of the data allows for continuous improvement to race cars. A modern Formula One car is equipped with 150 sensors. This allows the driver to monitor relevant indicators and adjust their driving. On the Red Bull team, around 90 staff analysts process data from these sensors. 500 constructors from the Williams team use similar data for their designs. Such peculiarities make Formula One less of a race and more of a business competition. Research from the City University in London has shown that production of passenger vehicles assists a brand in winning at Formula One. Within their own companies, Mercedes, Ferrari, and Renault all use their technology in both lines of production, for race cars and passenger vehicles. Additionally, production of passenger vehicles enriches the companies. This revenue is then invested into improving their Formula One team. However, the Red Bull team finances itself in a different way. Each year, the sale of nearly 7 billion cans of their energy drink helps cover the expense of running a garage. Surprisingly, the brand also benefits from selling its developments to other teams. According to research from the City University of London, by selling engines to two other teams, the manufacturer can collect data from six cars. 
This is because each team uses two cars in each race. Nevertheless, sometimes the technology doesn't live up to expectations. For example, in 2009, Formula One teams invested close to $64 million into KERS, or Kinetic Energy Recovery System. Race cars were equipped with this specialized device that stores energy during braking and gives it back during acceleration. However, in practice, it only added three-tenths of a second in additional speed and saved only 21 milliliters of fuel. Some teams disregarded this innovation and didn't lose anything. Red Bull still managed to take second place without the kinetic energy recovery system. But in most cases, technology makes the outcome of the races predictable. Consequently, many critics believe that Formula One has become boring, and everything relies on the car's constructive elements. However, in some conditions, engine power, aerodynamic characteristics, and other indicators become less important. For example, in the rain, when speeds are lower, the racer's chances even out. In these conditions, drivers of weaker cars can show off their skills. One racer, Ayrton Senna, became famous for getting his best results in a slow car during rainy weather. Because of this, fans dubbed him the Rain Man. What do you think? Has technology ruined the sport of racing? Or conversely, has it just made it cooler? Write us your opinion in the comments, like this video, and share it with your friends. We'll see you in the next episode.